streaming board the live we good all right my name is ramirez this is frog bear you can call me rammy uh so as usual uh i'm not going to name these because um i have no idea in what sequential order i need to discuss these things so they will be edited and eventually i'll come up with a longer format video that explains what i'm trying to explain which is i'm trying to explain the conspiracy of how us as a people as american citizens ended up in the situation that we're at now um and i'm explaining it not through just psychology not through my own experiences not through the experiences of others but through the experience of approaching this as just uh, as a gestaltist which is a holistic approach and not holistic as in herbal medicine but holistic in the sense of accounting for all of these systems that we interact with in our lives from childhood well in the, in my example today is from childbirth all the way up till you're 15. so as usual i like to use um i like to use things that i listen to um, to kind of set the tone for what I'm trying to explain. And as usual, I have a video. Now, the person asking the question this is very interesting woo woo, right? Because this guy uh, has one of those Davos pins, very sketch. Uh, I've watched that in a different video. And then the guy that he's asking the question to is somebody who works and is a professor at West Point and also is a very involved key figure for giving scientific approaches not just towards america but also towards europe so very interesting science guy so that's all i'll say for now i'll play the video oh, i need to mute myself first i've got a question relative to kind of the uh, conceit or the position of the stoa that is um you know know your work on multi-ontology sense making it's a it's an excellent framework that i think helps as a, as a reference for sorting out ontological and epistemological positions and ways of, of interacting and knowing um, how they might cross in communication. And so the, in the Stoa, there's it's kind of launched with this position of the time of metacrisis with hardened positions in this crisis arising in mimetic tribes. And so in these the mimetic tribes are, you know, the, the different trope tribes that we're shunted into. These can be seen as micro ontologies, right? They're ways that we're, we identify ourselves and hold not just to the tribe, but all the positions that go along with it. And they could blend, but we're kept in our swim lanes by this kind of new tribalism, social media, um, about propaganda, reinforcers. So we've got this world of strong norms and people are butting up against each other's positions all the time. My question would be then, given multi-ontology sense-making or how that might evolve, how do we break out of these, these strong normative lanes while holding our reputations, not getting canceled? How can we communicate um, within these expectation loops to help to help ourselves and help others blend ontologies in a, you know, I mean, to take some risk, right? How do we, how do we help? Um, I don't know if it's a change in way of thinking about your framework or using that in a way that we might communicate better to loosen the hold of these tribal mental models. I think there's some things we can bring in straight. So essentially, for those who thought his questioning was too wordy, he's trying to boil it down. He's essentially saying that we are all trapped within our own snow globe. We're all trapped within our own small petri dishes of cultures. And he's wondering, well, he actually lists a few of the things that are the things that are pushing us towards these tribes, towards these small enclaved enclosures. Jesus. Sorry about that. The wind is really strong today. But um, what he's trying to essentially bring together is how do we discuss ideas and how do we break out of these norms or what are the mechanisms that we can use in order to break out of these tribes or this mental these mental states that we entrap ourselves in. And I think it's funny, right? Because this is coming from the Davos guy. He has that colorful wheel pin, which is um, when Prince Charles essentially gave a speech at the World Economic Forum. That was the backdrop that was behind him. So I'm pointing towards a lot of things that I've seen. But funny that he answers his own questions. But his question is, how do we break out of that? And what I find hilarious is he's from the World Economic Forum. He's, a, he's working a part of the group that essentially sets up these mechanisms in order to divide people, um, which I thought was very interesting. Now, this guy 
His name is Dave Snowden. He's the guy that works at West Point as a professor. Um, I think it was something along strategic something. But uh, I want to highlight a very specific point that gets to my topic here. Uh, so I will skip a bit. Um, but what I'm trying to build a picture is malleable states and non-malleable states and how this answers Peter's question. So let me mute myself once more. Straight away, one is automatic trading algorithms which go through their schools into their community. Or So one of the programs which we're still trying to get funding for, but we've now done in Sweden, Colombia, Singapore, um, Egypt and elsewhere, is to use children as ethnographers through their schools into their communities on a continuous basis. So we put human interpretation and human validation of data rather than the classic black box. This is kind of like called rich data as opposed to thick data or, or big data. Yeah? So we increase the human buffering in the system, which also increases the empathy. The other thing we've also been doing there, which I'm quite proud of, is what we call transgenerational pairing. So that's linking young people with people in their grandparents' generation to come up with local initiatives. So trying to get away from grand initiatives to local initiatives locally generated. Now, again, that was science-based because we know that brain plasticity yeah, kind of like, unless you're traumatized, it kind of like stops in your early 20s and doesn't start again until your 50s. I really wanted to highlight what he said there. Unless you're traumatized, these mental facilities are hardened, right? If you're traumatized, that means you cannot access these mental facilities. Think about how they traumatize certain groups, certain, well, we'll call them certain ethnic groups, how they will... I can't say that it's somebody or an invisible person that creates these circumstances, but something was done prior to our existence that allowed for these facilities or these things to take a hold in the public mind. A perfect example is the destruction of black neighborhoods, not, th not just through drugs, right? For Harlem, it was heroin back in the 50s. For the rest of America, it was the crack epidemic of the 80s. Um, but then there's also the rise of single mothers. There's also the rise of using government funds to tell women, you better stay single, you better stay alone, or this government money goes away. And then there's also the fact that the, the courts are weaponized, right? That sort of circumstance not just destroys black men, but it destroys families as a whole with the divorce court. But what happens and occurs in the minds of those individuals, creating circumstances and environments that will perpetuate um, certain hurt states, certain emotions, certain ideas. And um, I was actually speaking this to my mom not that long ago because I decided to meddle in the affairs of one of my nieces. But I did it from a perspective of if I don't tell her and she makes her decisions, she's just going to like follow a perpetual cycle of abuse, a perpetual cycle of trauma. And she'll just repeat the same mistakes that my other sisters did, that her other aunts did, right? Perpetuating a cycle of trauma, a cycle of uh, nearsightedness where you can't see the future ahead of you. You want to have all this fun, but the price of fun is your happiness at the end of all of this. Because, you know what I mean? People will set themselves up with certain expectations. They'll set up this certain facade of the life that they should live. And when it doesn't meet those requirements in their head... Well, it will continue it will continue a perpetual cycle of just abuse and i would like to highlight examples like um single mothers using their babies against their baby fathers because of regret resentment or just altercations between the both but that's a much bigger topic because we also have to discuss why these people were formed or how did these people end up in these circumstances that they would imagine that using their child as a as a as artillery against their partner that doesn't make really much sense but again i just wanted to highlight if unless you're traumatized your mind just hardens it will never be he calls it plasticity but i call it malleable in the in the sense that your ideas can be formed and can be shaped but there's more to this so i'll highlight more So if you want innovation, you need to be under 25 or over 50. You don't get much between the two. Yeah? And the kind of like, I know every, everybody's going to like this one of these days, right? But it's actually quite interesting. Innovation in the sciences is under 25. In the humanities, it's generally when you're older. Because, and the evolutionary argument, it's because it's synthesis, not flashes of genius. It's the ability to bring things together, which is what the humanities is about. Right? So if you look at it in evolutionary terms, we have the longest period of training of any mammal. So there's very high levels of plasticity up until two. In fact, as far as we can see, some of your neocortex processing is actually done by your carers until two. 
we, we don't quite know the mechanism for it yet, but it's actually why if you don't get the right level of nurture in those first two years, there are capacities which you never get a chance to develop again. It, it, it's an absolutely critical period. Um, as you start to hit puberty, the brain starts to lock down because you've got to go and hunt for the tribe. Yeah, and whatever the prejudices of the tribe, you'll adopt. You actually don't see racism in kids and before puberty. Yeah, but it comes in big time after puberty. Yeah? And then interestingly, chemically triggered male or female, you know, mid 40s, 50s, it becomes plastic again. And the argument is if you survive to that age in a hunter-gatherer tribe, you've got something about you which the tribe needs, but you better bloody well stop leading it because you're not fit enough anymore. So you go and sit around the campfire and look after the kids and teach them. Yeah? So I'm describing that, right, this is not his field. His field is something completely different. It's more strategic, right? He uh, gives a few stories uh, early on in the, um, in the video where he talks about his work that he did for uh, U.S. intelligence and um, whatever. The point is, this is a known science. These are known facts, right? I might be using him as an example. I could find the authority of child development or whatever. The way he approaches what I'm trying to explain is we are all stuck in a tribe. We are all stuck in a trope. We are all stuck in a mimetic tribe and we're replicating the behaviors that we learned from whatever we think the tribe needs. Right. Hence why he also used the example of um, using, right, if you made it to the age of 40, that means there's something about you, which means you have to pass that knowledge down to future generations. But nobody wants to quantify that now. And quantifying that now would mean how did our education system end up the way it does, right? Some people could say no child left behind. Some people could say the Rockefeller Institution um, influence. Some people could say the textbook industry influence. Some people could talk about lobbyist groups and all these other facets of systems that are incorporated that actually create the reality tunnel that we live in. So malleable versus non-malleable or unmalleable. What I'm trying to explain is prejudices, your ideas, your thoughts, how you behave yourself are all learned and conditioned behaviors that come from somewhere. Nobody now wants to quantify that. Everybody likes to think that they're a special snowflake in the, in the, in the air or whatever. Oh no, I'm unique in the way that I think and behave. When in reality, not really. Which is why I look at 4chan as a, a, a 4chan politics poll. I use that as a great example because everybody on there keeps repeating the same identi identity tropes. They keep repeating the same identity. Isn't that hilarious that on an anonymous board where you can operate, right? That's why trolling was a thing because when you're trolling, you're literally portraying yourself with belief systems that you really don't have. But there's always a consistent thing of worshiping Hilario or worshiping um, fascistic ideas, worshiping big government, obfuscated by the idea that it's based on red pill. And I find it hilarious that nobody's decided to realize or nobody's decided to highlight that our ideas, the way we perceive things, the way that we act was largely conceived and we've picked up those behaviors and have learned them and passed them down from generation to generation to generation. So, largely, this is why this needs to be a chapter in the book because your reality tunnel has been accounted for. Every single step in the process that you make from childbirth, right? He said, if you aren't properly cared for or nurtured by the age of two, there are things that you cannot recover. Absolutely not recover. It's why they also talk about how learning languages much younger in your childhood is more beneficial and it's easier for a child to learn these facets of language earlier than it is later. But it's not to say that an adult can't learn a language. It's just harder because your ideas, who you are, your identity has solidified itself. And one of the key points that he brings up is we have the largest training period for any mammal. Any mammal. Most mammals are just kicked out of the nest. Like, all right, get out. Like you're meant to fend on your own at this point. Which is what I think is hilarious because our training is up until we're 18. And that's if you don't decide to pursue a professional career. But now think about what the idea or the facets or the systems that are designed around a professional career. And think about how having a professional career, um, in order for you to acquire that, you need a piece of paper that gives you the status in order to enter that field of knowledge. Um, right? 
These are just things that I'm trying to describe very loosely. The, the system to it, I tried drawing a diagram. It got way too complicated, way too fast. Um, and the reason for that is because it might look complicated, but in reality, these are very simple systems that loop into each other. Um, which is why I brought up, uh, so when I was talking to my mother this morning, um, what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about how one of my sisters is very unorganized. And I had to explain to her, I'm like, this isn't something that you can just learn by the, by the time that you're, how old is my sister? 38 at this point? I try to explain to her, it's very difficult to try to teach this to somebody who's already well past the, the ages of forming or creating a habit and solidifying it into somebody's personality. Because I was trying to explain to her, I'm like, yeah, you can buy her the cabinet, you can do all this, but it won't change the fact that she's already accustomed to a way of living. In order for her to approach your thought, your level of thought process, she needs that as a skill ingrained in her first organizational skills in order for her to utilize that drawer that you want to get her. Beyond that, she won't get anywhere with it. She'll probably just stack it along with every other thing in the house. So it's kind of what gave me the idea of making this because malleability is very important because you aren't allowed access to it. No parent in America is allowed access to their child long enough in order to influence that state of mind or in order to influence in any meaningful degree what the child needs in a realistic life. Public school doesn't teach you this. Um, I'd imagine that there are certain private schools that do teach you this, but again, the, the obfuscation of authority is given to the state or given to the teacher or given to whatever institution you hand your child over to. They will look at that thing, that figure of authority, and put it above whatever their parents say. Because, by and large, most parents have given away their power of influence to, of their child over to whatever teacher or institution is teaching them. Thus creating this sense of trusting the state, trusting the institution, or having the idea that you can trust something else to do what you need. Very interesting systems. What's my time? 17 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna end it here. But, um, it's very key to understand that mechanism in uh, child development. And the reason why I bring this up is because this was one of the very first things that was taught or talked about at uh, Cybernetics, the conference that Macy, Josiah Macy's foundation sponsored. Because by and large, these are the people that were not just trying to steer human population and breeding as a health program, but they were also trying to figure out what makes humanity tick because they were tired of having their workers rebel against them. Um, a perfect example is the Greensboro the incident that occurred in Greensboro and how this very new identity group of neo-Nazis were like, these unions are so pesky, which was one of the initial blocks that knocked over um, in taking away power from the workers and giving it to the big tobacco industry. And yet they used an identity, a political idea, in order to perpetuate um, the destruction of unions against the tobacco industry and they used people with idealistic beliefs and utopian beliefs in order to largely affect uh, how union workers were striking against the big tobacco industry. But um, again, I'm just trying to say that people were hijacked because they knew that they weren't going to be smart enough to break out of this feedback loop system because their ideas were molded by whatever mechanisms were put into place right you can use rhetoric this is why i don't like reading books like i would love to finish reading this book but it uses jesus the catholic the religion far too much in its language to try to invoke some sense of like i don't know sympathy and i don't really like that give me the knowledge give it to me straight don't use the veneer of like spiritual language in order to entice me into anything um that's just one example. Either way, my name is Ramirez, and hopefully, hopefully this gets easier the more I write. <laughs>